Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Bouchard Vassal North America Lamotabi webinar. Today, we are here to talk about wine balance. My name is Eglantine Chauffour. I will be your speaker today. I'm the winemaking product manager for La Motabier with Bouchard Vassin North America. So before we start the topic of the webinar, I would like to introduce you the two partners for this webinar. We have Bouchard Vassin North America. Bouchard Vassin is a designer, manufacturer and seller of material for grape and wine processing since 1856. So about 160 years of history in the wine industry. We have also La Motabier. La Motabier is a winemaking product brand that is coming from France. They are very well known for their high quality and premium product. They have been founded in 1878, so it's 140 years of expertise in winemaking consulting. They mainly stayed in Europe. We are now making it available for you in North America via Boucher Vasselin North America. Because Boucher Vasselin in North America wants to extend their portfolio to be able to offer to winemakers a complete solution through the entire process. They are partnering with La Motabier, but also with Costral Bottling Line and Caso Wine Pump. So today, we are gonna talk about the different components of wine mouthfeel and their interaction. We will go through the principle of wine balance. Also, I will focus on tannins and polysaccharide, which are two big families that participate to the balance of wine mouthfeel and two big families that are not so well known in winemaking. We'll talk about how to set up bench trial and then we will have our usual question and answer portion at the end. So, as we all know, winemaking is part science, but part art. So understanding the wine analysis, chemistry, microbiology are essential, is essential to control and produce quality wine in a sustainable way. When we talk about balance, we are entering actually in a more subjective, creative world that is letting space to personality, imagination, and feelings. So we are talking about art. As any art, guideline needs to be followed. So for example, dancers, they need techniques, equilibrium, and rhythm to perform. Painters, they need, or photographers, they need to learn how to manipulate elements of perspective, the use of light and shadow. Musicians, they need to study rules of harmony to compose. So winemakers needs to understand the interaction between wine compounds to create an harmonious wine and an harmonious product. So that's what we are gonna talk about today. So an important thing is a balanced wine is actually a perfect equilibrium between acidity, phenolic aggressivity, and sweet body volume. So these are part of the main uh, taste that we can find in food industry and in wine industry. So actually, the taste topic is a pretty um, argued topic, I would say, because since some people think tastes are infinite and some people put them in five categories, which are sweet, acid, sour, bitter, salt, mineral, and umami. So in winemaking, we are mainly talking about sweet and volume so sweet uh, taste and volume sensation which are going to participate to this part of the triangle sweet and volume but also acidity which is like lemon lime and the tart sensation and then aggressivity phenolic which is bitter that we can find in coffee cocoa radicchio red cabbage and astringency let me focus a little bit about astringency which is a sensation of aggressivity Astringency is so. Ast so astringency is like an unripe persimmon or green bananas, cranberry. It's directly due to tannins interacting with your prote protein, salivary protein. So when they interact together, they form a complex that is going to precipitate, which means that we suddenly have no more salivary protein, so we lack of lubrification on our tongue and we have the sensation of dryness, astringency. So this depends on each individual because it depends on the saliva flow, but also it depends on the type of tannin and the degree of polymerization of these tannins. So in any case, a balanced wine is a perfect equilibrium in these three categories. And this is gonna depend on each wine. There is no number that are um, 
that I can give you because it's really um, depending on each wine. Okay, since most feel is actually a pretty complex uh, topic and a pretty um, subjective topic, we are gonna make it even more complicated because aroma and color can be part of it. So when we stimulate our other sense, senses, such as smell, vision, touch, or sounds, this can dictate how we perceive flavor. So to give you an example, if we smell an herbaceous vegetal or green um, aroma, we're gonna think the wine is more acid, so it's gonna pull the triangle toward the acidity line. If you see um, red wine or pink wine, so a rosé wine that is more pink and red, we are gonna think it smells more fruity, berries, and it's sweeter. Okay, so I'm not gonna enter today in the neurological and psychological effect of the aromas. I'm gonna stick with these three categories and actually we will even more develop the sweet body volume and the phenolic aggressivity component of the mouse field. So here you will see a table that is gonna represent what is playing uh, in positively in the perception of sweet, acid, and aggressivity and what plays negatively, so what can reduce this perception. This table is based from the study done by Bruce Zocklin in 2005. So sweet volume body, we have ethanol. When you start to have ethanol higher than 14%, um, we are gonna increase the sensation, the perception of volume. Polysaccharide and sugar will participate positively in sweet volume and body. On the negative side, we have phenolic compounds, acids and sulfur compounds that are gonna reduce this perception of sweet volume and body. So when we want to balance um, a meal or a drink, a cocktail, for example, uh, that is too sweet, you can use acids or more like astringency to balance this sweetness. Same with wine. Acidity, so acid herbaceous notes that I just told you before, phenolic compounds, more on the aggressivity side, so astringency and bitterness will increase the perception of acidity. It's not changing the pH, it's not changing the number of total acidity, but it increases the perception. Negative um, impact on acidity is ethanol, sugar, polysaccharide, but also overripe aromas and spicy aromas. In terms of phenolic aggressivity, obviously phenolic compounds. When I say phenolic compounds here, I mean the content of the phenolic compounds you have in the wine, but also the type of phenolic compounds you have available in the wine. Acid, sulfur compound, and ethanol will increase the perception of aggressivity in the wine, while polysaccharide and sugar will decrease the perception of acidity. Okay, so as you can see, a lot of these um, compounds are all related and they are gonna pull the triangle on one way or the other. So we are talking about balancing everything. In this table, I would like to focus on phenolic compounds and polysaccharide, which are big families that participate in the three categories of wine mouthfeel. Okay, so let's start first with the phenolic compounds. Tannins in wine have um, two big categories. So we have the hydrolyzable tannins, which are regrouping gallic tannins and elagic tannins. So gallic tannins are coming from gallnut or taranut. They are actually commonly used in Chinese medicine for antimicrobial, antioxidant effect, and commonly used in the tanning, leather tanning industry because they react strongly with protein. So saying this, you can understand that in wine, we are using them for antimicrobial, antioxidant, and also antioxidasic or removing proteins. Um, because it removes proteins, you can imagine that uh, it, they react pretty strongly in our mouth. When we taste them, they are pretty astringent. They are gonna react strongly with our salivary protein, which is gonna induce strong astringency. Elagic tannin, tannins are oak tannins or chestnut tannins. So we found them in wine when you age wine in barrel or if you use oak chips or oak staves. Condensed tannins, they can also have two different origins. So we have the proanthocyanidin from the grapes, which means from skin and seeds. So these can be monomers as catechin, but they can also be polymers. 
So seeds have more monomers, they are a little bit more reactive. Uh, skin have, are more polymers, which are usually playing on the structure and the mouthfeel of the wine. So that's the tannin that will give you really weight and structure. The second origin of condensed tannin can be exotic wood, which means quebracho or mimosa. So um, they have pretty barbar names. So it's profecitinidin and probinetidin. So these two um, monomers, as you can see their chemical structure here, have a particularity. They look very similar to the prontocyanidin of the grapes. The big difference is that they can't polymerize themselves. So you find them mainly in monomer stage. Then they can polymerize with other phenolic compounds, but not between them. Okay, so these exotic woods are um, additive tannins that we use in winemaking. Why do we use tannins? So as you can see, um, we have different type of tannins. They all can be used in winemaking at different steps of the process and for different goals due to their different action reaction with the wine component. So we can have antioxidant action. This is mainly focusing on gallic tannins, elagic tannins, and also condensed tannin from exotic wood, which are in monomer forms. So very reactive with uh, oxygen radicals. Antioxidasic. So um, antioxidasic would be to inhibit the lacase or the polyphenol oxidase that will oxidize your grapes and juice. Uh, they are enzymes, so they are proteins. So we use gallic tannin that reacts strongly with protein for this application. We can remove protein also. So we go again in our gallic tannin category. So removing protein could be for helping to stabilize color in red wine, but also um, stabilize protein haze in white or rosé. Tannins can be used to regulate redox potential or increase aroma cleanliness or enhance aromatic expression. So to regulate redox potential, we are using oak tannins. Oak tannins, usually uh, untoasted oak tannins are the best to regulate redox potential. So they are going to stabilize your redox potential and give you wines that are aging longer without moving towards oxidation or reduction too quickly, which means you can increase aroma cleanliness with the same type of tannins also. You enhance aromatic expression because you add aromas with oak tannins or because you are just expressing more the grape tannins that they are by changing the redox potential. So for this category, we are mainly talking about oak ta elagic tannins and toasted or toasted oak. Then we can stabilize color. So for this, we need mainly monomers. So any tannins from exotic wood or tannins from seeds or gallic tannins or elagic tannins will be good for stabilizing color and help the polymerization. And then we can balance mouthfeel. This, as I told you before, to balance mouthfeel, we usually want to work with more refined tannins that will just give you structure and um, weight, but not a tannin that is astringent. So we are more talking about elagic tannins or grape tannins. Okay, so let me introduce you the toolbox of La Motabie in terms of analogical tannins. We have three categories. The first one would be tan essence, which is oak tannins. So we have tan essence volume, it is our untoasted oak tannin, and tan essence forte, that is our toasted oak tannin. We use this category of tannin as antioxidants, but mainly for regulating the redox potential of the wine to increase the oxidation re resistance, so the, the resistance towards oxidation, sorry, of the wine, we can use this tannin, but also give some structure and linearity of the wine. So a wine that could be too heavy, you're gonna shape the wine with giving it some angle and some linearity. And obviously we are gonna increase the oak aromas. One word that goes very well with tan essence tannins uh, is precision. And I like to imagine them with some angles, so you are shaping the wine. Second category is vinitan. Vinitan advance is a tannin from grape, extracted from grape. So this tannin is mainly used in maturation to give structure, to stabilize color, 
to improve aging potential. So you give structure and body baseline to the wine, which also is going to lift the fruit characters that are already present. So this wine is very, this tannin is very well described by the word purity because we are expressing, enhancing, and harmonizing the wine. We are expressing whatever is already present from the grapes. So this is a tannin very useful to round up some angles and make the wine as one integral product. So I like to represent it with this uh, square shape with really round angles. It's also a very good wine when you have a, a very, good, very good tannin when you have a wine that is a little bit like a donut type that is missing or lacking of meat palate. Vinitan Advance is going to fill this hole and make the wine fully integral. Last category is a category of the soft tan, tannins. So this um, category is very uh, specific. It has a unique process of production that is combining tannins and polysaccharide, plant polysaccharide together to give a product that benefit from the strengths of the tannins to give structure and stabilization, but also benefits of the softness of the polysaccharide to increase the volume and to give this feeling of softness. So this tannin is very well, this category of tannin is very well represented by a big circle. It's making the wine bigger, rounder, so it can balance some um, edges of the wine or some like, lack of volume. Okay, in this category, we, want, we have two tannins, soft tannin V for vinification. We can use it during fermentation towards maturation. Soft tannin FT for final touch, we can use it closer to bottling. So two days pre-bottling, we can use this tannin. Okay, so now I would like to show you some um, trial result that put in evidence how these tannins are working. So the first one is about Vinitan Advance. So the grape tannin I just show you, talk about, which is completely filtrable and stable in wine. We did a trial where we added Vinitan Advance to a previous stringent wine, and we measured the salivary protein index into this wine. Salivary protein index is gonna show, um, is gonna completely represent the astringency. We are measuring how the wine reacts with salivary protein. So what is very important here is you can see how when we increase the dosage of Vinitan Advance, we are actually decreasing the perception of astringency. This can look a little bit um, surprising and weird, I would say, because we are balancing astringency by adding a tannin. But in reality, it does work. This tannin is very soft. And this tannin is gonna, as I told you, like in a wine that is lacking homogeneous and harmony, this wine is gonna fill the, this tannin is gonna fill the gaps and make the wine as completely uniform. So you don't perceive astringency anymore, but you perceive length and a bigger wine. So your tannins are not reacting with your salivary protein, but they are reacting between each other to make just a smoother wine. Okay, secondly, I would like to share a quote uh, with you, a quote from Christian Rogona, which is a winemaker of the year 2017. Uh, Christian has over 35 vintage of experience and he did many trials with tannins. This year, he used soft V on all his red ferments and his conclusion that was, was that soft V is the best tannin on the market. Why this? Because Soft V is a very soft tannin that improves the wine structure and balance. It helps color stabilization, but mostly, most importantly, is completely integrated into the wine. So Christian liked these tannins really because he couldn't taste the tannin in the wine. It just made the wine very soft, very uniform, and very appealing in terms of structure and body. Okay, so this is very... I, this category is very important. The phenolic category is very important into the triangle of wine mouthfeel, but also you have to understand that some tannins will increase this aggressivity and pull the triangle on one way, but some tannins are actually going to decrease the feeling of aggressivity and astringency and make the wine more uniform and balance the wine by itself. So 
the phenolic line can be pulled on one way or the other depending the tannin you are using. So be careful with the category of tannin you are using and speak with your supplier with which tannin you can play on increasing or decreasing this aggressivity and this phenolic uh, point in the triangle. The second category I would like to talk about is polysaccharides. Okay, polysaccharides are participating to sweetness, volume, and body of the wine. So polysaccharides are polymer of sugar, usually more than 20 units. In winemaking, we can find them from grapes. They are the pectin polysaccharides. We can find them from yeast. They are uh, manoprotein. They are released from the yeast cell walls during fermentation and autolysis of the yeast. We can find them from oak. Oak have some polysaccharide that are extractable. So when you age on oak or even if you ferment on oak, you are extracting these polysaccharides. We can find them when we add plant polysaccharide, which are Arabic gum. So Arabic gum is coming from acacia's tree. And as you will see, it's a polysaccharide that participates a lot to the mouthfeel of the wine. And then the polysaccharide we don't want to find can come from botrytis. But when you have botrytis on grapes, botrytis is going to produce glucans. This glucans goes into the wine. This polysaccharide is a very big molecule that is actually impacting negatively the wine because it makes the wine very hard to clarify and very hard to filter. So the application in winemaking of this, uh, all these polysaccharides are actually pretty multitasking. They can stabilize protein, tartrate, and color. They can reduce astringency, and they can increase the volume and sweetness sensation. So today, we are mostly interested by the two last points, which is reducing astringency and increasing volume, sweetness, and sensation. So let's see more about this interaction and how polysaccharide can actually um, do these things. So here I'm going to present you the thesis of Benoit Fauri done in 2017 on the effect of wine polysaccharide on astringency. So I'm going to be talking about different polysaccharides and their interaction between tannins and also the interaction between tannin and salivary protein, which is related to astringency. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the two big scenarios that uh, Benoit thought about in his thesis. So first of all, we have to look at how protein react with tannins. Salivary protein react with tannins. They make a complex that is going to precipitate, which creates the lack of lubrification and dryness sensation. How can we um, limit this sensation? First uh, scenario, polysaccharide, as you see here, is a C. Uh, the big C uh, part, can coat this complex tannin polysaccharides and stabilize it, make it not precipitate. Second scenario, salivary protein actually will detach, will dissociate from the tannins, and the tannin polysaccharide will become a complex. So in the second hypothesis, we will have uh, in interaction tannin polysaccharides stronger than tannin protein. Okay, and this means that we leave our salivary protein by itself, so it does the job that it has to do, and we are not having this sensation of dryness. Okay, so I summarize the results uh, in this table, which um, here you can see the dissociation constant of glucose, pectin, and arabic gum with epigallocatechin galat, which is the tannin that uh, Benoit used in his thesis to replicate or to represent the wine phenolic compounds. Okay, it's a tannin that is naturally present in wine and in actually pretty high concentration, but also it's a very stable tannin that makes the trials easier um, for repeatability. Mm -hmm. And you look at this dissociation constant with or without salivary protein. So the idea is that if you have an interaction in the scenario number one, when you have salivary protein, you change the dissociation constant. If you are in scenario number two, salivary protein or not, you will not change the dissociation constant because you will have a direct, um, you will just have a direct complex between tannin and polysaccharide. 
Okay, so as you can see in this table, we don't change the dissociation constant. So, which means that the scenario number two is true. Tannin and polysaccharide interact directly together, leaving the salivary protein alone. So, we don't make complex tannin protein. So, we don't have this dryness sensation. So, we limit astringency. Second information in this table is that Arabic gum has the strongest affinity with tannins. So if you compare glucose, pectin, and Arabic gum, and we look at the constant, the dissociation constant, the Arabic gum is the smallest, which means it's harder to dissociate the complex tannin polysaccharide. Okay, so Arabic gum is gonna be the most um, effective polysaccharide to bind with tannins. In conclusion of this thesis, plus other literature that you can see on the bottom of this slide, Arabic gum, pectin, and glucose react directly with tannins. There is no reaction between polysaccharide and salivary protein. So the polysaccharide don't form a complex with this salivary protein. Nothing happens when they are only them two together. And in terms of the different polysaccharide, Arabic gum has the strongest affinity with tannin and requires less concentration to react with tannin. A very important point also is that this polysaccharide don't influence the autopolymerization of tannin. So even if we do make a complex polysaccharide tannin, this tannin can still polymerize between each other and make more smooth tannin or have different interaction um, with other compounds in the wine. So in conclusion, the application of Arabic gum in wine is to reduce astringency, and this is chemically proven, it's not just a feeling, but also it can stabilize color. Okay, so now speaking about Arabic gum, I would like to explain you a little bit more about the differences between Arabic gums. So as I told you before, Arabic gum come from acacia trees that are coming from North Africa. There is two different type of trees that um, can give Arabic gum we use in winemaking. You have the acacia verek that is giving you um, bigger molecules that usually are used to stabilize color or colloids. So in La Motabier, we have the gum LA, which is made, it's a liquid form that is made with acacia verek and we use it for color stabilization. Then the second one is acacia sayal. Acacia sayal is more used, it's smaller molecule and it's more used for mouthfeel and uh, this reducing astringency and giving volume sensation. So at La Motabier, we have the Excel gum, which is a powder that is instantly uh, soluble granules, actually. And we use it mainly on finishing, uh, as a finishing product to increase the volume and to balance the mouthfeel of the wine. So in the family of um, polysaccharides, we don't have only pectin, glucose, and Arabic gum, we also have, as I showed you before, manoprotein. So let's talk a little bit about manoprotein, which are um, yeast extracted from yeast cell walls. So they have been studied for many years and by many people. So there is a lot of literature about how manoprotein react with wine compounds. So I'm trying to summarize them for you now. But first of all, manoprotein are Polysaccharide, 80 to 90 percent polysaccharides, which are chain of mannose and glucose, and 10 to 20 percent protein. This ratio that can change depending on the manoprotein we are talking about and depending the yeast we are talking about. And the condition this yeast has been um, produced. Okay? So the first thing is, it's not new. Manoprotein effect on wine stability has been known. We know this since 1933. When I say we, it's actually Ribeiro Gaillon found it in 1933. So it's a pretty old discovery, okay? And we know it acts on wine stability. So manoprotein can stab act as a stabilizing agent in wine by preventing protein haze and by inhibiting crystal crystallization of tartaric salt. So knowing this, La Motabie came out with um, STAB-K, which is a liquid manoprotein that is used to stabilize tartaric salt precipitation. 
also, we know that manoprotein can interact directly with phenolic compounds as a stabilizer, so as a stabilizer of color, but also as reducing astringency as we saw previously. So previously we talked about Arabic gum, but manoprotein can have exactly the same effect interacting directly with tannins. So STAP-K is actually used to stabilize against tartaric precipitation, but also to stabilize color and to reduce astringency. The last point is that manoprotein act as a aroma support. So when you put manoprotein into a wine, you will have a longer um, longevity of the aromatic expression of the wine and, um, and it's protecting them. Yeah. Okay, so if we look a little bit closer um, on the effect of manoprotein on astringency, color stability and sweetness, and then also where, uh, what I want to show you in these slides is that there is big difference depending which yeast and which manoprotein we are talking about. So this table that I took from Escott in a study, Escott study from 2002, is showing you how the addition of manoprotein can impact the gelatin index, which represents astringency, the PVPP index that represents color stability, and the ethanol index that represents sweetness. So as you see, as you can see here, when we add manoprotein, we are reducing the astringency perception we're increasing the color stability and we are increasing the sweetness, okay? Very important information also in this table is that you can see that from the manoprotein of the yeast number one to the manoprotein from the yeast number two, there is a big difference in terms of reducing astringency, color stability, and increasing sweetness. Okay, so this is opening new doors to new um, reading and new studies and to find out which manoprotein is the most efficient. Axel Marshall in 2010 made um, his thesis on the sweetness sensation in dry wine and he looked at different polysaccharides for this. One of his findings was that in terms of manoprotein, the HSP12 that is extracted from Saccharomyces cerevisiae membrane is participating strongly to the sweetness of the wine. So knowing this, Lamotabier went ahead and took this HSP12 manoprotein and put it uh, in blend with Arabic gum to create sublicense, which is a product that will stabilize colloids, stabilize aromas, but also increase the sweetness of the wine and decrease the astringency of the wine. So sublicense is more a finishing product that we add pre-bottling to uh, balance the wine mouthfeel. Again, it's a tool to make sure this triangle of acidity, phenolic aggressivity, and body volume sweetness is completely um, balanced for each wine. So talking about a product that you can add pre-bottling, I want to make sure we all know that before doing this, you have the opportunity to do bench trial, actually. So you can try this product, add them into wine, and see how you balance this triangle. I didn't talk about acid, the acidity part. Acidity is pretty easy because you basically have to do trials of acidification or deacidification. It's not always easy to change, but you can do a trial easily. Talking about trial, I want to... Um, focus a little bit on how to set up a bench trial. Okay, so this maybe look complicated, but it's a pretty easy thing to do. I'm very happy to help, ex help you and explain you later after this webinar how to set it up and work step by step with you, especially in the calculation of the dosage you need to do. But let's talk about it quickly right now. So you will have to make a solution at one or two percent usually of the tannin or polysaccharide. Okay, so for, to make a solution at 1%, you're going to take one gram of tannin and you're going to put it in 100 ml of 13% hydroalcoholic solution. Why 13%? This is mainly to not dilute your wine and to keep the solution stable through time so you don't have to remake it all the time. You shake it and you have this um, complete solution here that you can use. Okay, now that's when you have to do the calculation of how much of this solution you need to add into your wine 
to replicate a dosage. So in this example, we are using it directly into wine glasses. I put 100 ml in my wine glass. So if I want 5 grams per hectoliters, which is a 0.005% of dosage, so if you look at this formula here, 0.005%, I'm in 100 ml, I'm working with a 1% solution, I have to add 0.5 milliliter. Okay? If I want to do 10 grams per hectolitre, I will have to add 1 milliliter. So I add it with a pipette, I mix my glass, and then I'm ready to evaluate by tasting. Pretty easy, pretty fast uh, trial to do, and it gives you already a good idea of how the tannin or the polysaccharide is going to react into your wine, which means you know how it's going to react into your tank. You don't jump blind to make an addition that you might regret later down the road. Okay, still talking about bench trial, I actually would like to give you some tips so you don't have to go through the entire presentation again when you have to balance your wine. I can give you some, um, some tips to balance bitterness, astringency, or a different type of wine. So let's talk about this now. So if, you, if you, for example, you want to balance bitterness, uh, if you go on the additive approach, which means adding tannins, polysaccharide, you, or even acids. In bitterness, you will want to deacidify your wine, but you can also work on Arabic gum and manoprotein, in this case, Sublicense, which is our blend Arabic gum manoprotein, or Excel gum, which is our pure Arabic gum. Soft NFT for final touch. So soft NFT is going to be a very good approach if you want to do it just pre-bottling and it's a tannin that will give you still some body, but since it's wrapped up with polysaccharide, it gives you this roundness and reduce the astringency, um, or the bitterness that you can feel. Okay, in the subtractive approach, so that's a very interesting point that I didn't talk about. Subtractive approach is um, removing whatever is making your triangle pulled on one way. So in this case, removing the little phenolic compounds that are responsible for bitterness through fining. So in this case, you can want to use isinglass, casein, PVPP, or gelatin. Okay. If you want to balance astringency, so in the subtractive way, we are talking about PVPP or gelatin. In the additive way, we go back to our polysaccharide and manoprotein, so the sublicense, or just Arabic gum with Excel gum, soft NFT, so same reasons than previously, and the Vinitan Advance, as we saw in the graph at the beginning of the presentation, Vinitan Advance is able to balance a wine and make it one integral product without feeling astringency, because it reduces the salivary protein index. So if we go a little bit more into different case scenario, so here you have a big table that represents different uh, type of wine. So you can have like a light wine with green and rough tannins that, for example, during maturation, you can work with soft and V or Tannessence Forte, which is a toasted oak tannin. The reason why I put Tannessence Forte is that toasted tannins tends to be very good in balancing green character. So as soon as you have these green aromas, you want to balance it with toasted tannins, it works very well. And then when we're closing to, closer to bottling, soft NFT or Excel gum would be a good approach. If we are looking at a heavy wine with a very high pH, high alcohol, viscous wine, this wine will need to be balanced. This wine will need some acidity and some aggressivity in terms of phenolic compounds. You need body, you need line and angles. So you can use the Tannessence range, the volume and the forte, which will give you these angles that could be enough to shape the wine and give it some freshness. But you can also use Vinitan Advance to, give, to increase the phenolic content and to give just a stronger base and make a bigger wine. So this table, as you can see, there is a different case scenario here. Here you have the different product of La Motabier and they are ordered in a timeline. So the first one are more for maturation moment to add until Tannessence volume. The Tannessence Forte and Vinipan Advance, you have um, up to 15 days pre-bottling to add them. And then all the others, so Soft Tan FT, 
Excel gum, sublicense, or stab K can be added up to two days pre bottling, pre final filtration. Okay, so this is a table that I'm not going to go through entirely. You will have this table available, and this is mainly guideline for you to balance your wine uh, properly into this triangle uh, acidity, body, volume, sweetness, and aggressivity. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, to conclude on this presentation, balancing wine is an art. And as we talked about, any art needs guidelines to help to achieve qualitative results. So here today, I was um, my goal was to give you a palette of uh, the toolbox. So let's imagine we are a painter. I gave you a palette of color, but also I'm helping you producing a color. So I'm telling you, if you want to do purple, you will have to mix red and blue. Which nuances of red and which nuances of blue? This is completely depending to you and each wine and what you what is your um, desirable goal, you know. But the goal of today was to give you some toolbox and some guideline to help you achieving the results you want and balancing your wine. Think, don't forget this triangle between acidity, volume, and phenolic compounds, and you will make your um, bench trial much faster and much easier. So thank you very much for your attention. You can find this webinar and the previous one on the, our YouTube channel. If you click on the logo here, you will get it. But also you can visit our website. Our webinars are on our website. And you can email me any question you have at eglantine.chauffour at bouchervasin.com. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>